We'll now have uh, Mrs. Shelby Dennis, who already gave a very good presentation yesterday. She is the founder of Milestone Question, certified equine behavior consultant from the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. She is also a member of the Alliance for Horse Welfare in Sport. I am also a founding member of that alliance, and that is Caroline Haggerty from Equitopia, who built this uh, alliance. It's very fresh, very new, and it's a bit of a let's get together to speak up group, isn't it? So um, Shelby will speak about, we have to speak up also a little bit more as she would um, interpret it. Ma Thank you very much, Shelby. She comes all the way from Canada. Okay. Once again, thank you for having me. Um, there is one citation that I have added to my speech that I did not have time to put the actual citation in this PowerPoint. Um, because the discussion with the FEI officials gave me some stuff to think about, and I made some last-minute changes. But if anyone wants that citation, I can give it to you after the presentation. Anyways, so my talk is about why we should advocate for horse welfare and just factors to consider when we're talking about speaking up for horse welfare. Um, my personal journey with starting to speak up for horse welfare, because I did not always used to have the beliefs that I've had. So... We must advocate for horses because they cannot advocate for themselves. Horses who keep trying to fight to communicate their discomfort despite being punished are often ruled as bad horses and they may be discarded due to behavioral problems. And the ones who eventually give in and just accept what happens to them despite being uncomfortable with it can end up in learned helplessness. Like horses, many riders experience learned helplessness. Most of us did not start off being abusive to horses or engaging in harmful training methods. Most kids who start out riding don't want to hit their horses. They don't want to be harsh with them. They don't want to yank on their reins. But time and time again, they're told by instructors, it's fine, it doesn't hurt them, it's okay. And if you continue to speak out and question practices despite that, a lot of instructors and people higher up, professionals, get uncomfortable with those questions and their discomfort will cause them to use tactics to try to silence you, which then will eventually lead riders to feeling like there's no point in speaking up, and they can end up in a state of learned helplessness, just like their horses. So this is the new slide I added. Gaslighting and other man manipulation tactics are common tactics to prevent speaking out and questioning the status quo. I have this quote here from the FEI's horse welfare um, page that I wrote down because when they brought that up, it was very interesting to me. So it says, at all times, horse welfare must be paramount. Welfare of the horse must never be subordinated to, be, to c competitive or commercial influences. I think it goes without saying that that's happening. So what I'm going to go into next in this speech is that intent and impact are different. An uh, organization can intend to police people and avoid these types of things, but if their actions are not actually doing that, and they're using terms like this to try to silence people or kind of dampen the level of outrage that there is when they're not doing enough to protect the horses. In my opinion, it is a form of gaslighting because it's used to try to stop people from speaking out and imply that more stuff to fix the problem is happening than it actually is. Um, the other thing that I want to note that I think would be in line with gaslighting manipulation is one of the comments in that speech um, from one of the judges about us kind of being overinflated in our level of outrage. Um, this is a room full of professionals, people with extensive education in equine sciences and behavior. And I can't speak for this for certain, but I would imagine most of the people in this room have a higher level of education in horse behavior and equine sciences to determine whether or not hyperflexion and other issues are harmful to the horse than most people who are judging horse shows because it is not required of them to do so. Um, so with that in mind, I do think that there needs to be a level of understanding given to people who are highly educated to speak on those topics, whether or not it makes people who are judging riders at the show uncomfortable. Accountability is how we enact meaningful change. That's why I added that slide. I think accountability is necessary. We can't give people a pat on the back for virtue signaling and doing what is or may be the bare minimum. Um, so we need to hold them accountable. Words have to be followed by actions. Otherwise, they're just words. Anyone can say what people want to hear. 
it's really easy to do so. And when you're in a room full of people who are criticizing your practices, you're going to say what they wanna hear because otherwise you're in a shark tank and you're opening yourself up to being torn apart. So accountability is how we enact change. Action is important and hopefully after this um, conference, we'll see change enacted and action put in place. So. There is little to no quality control for professionals in the industry. This is part of the problem that I think a lot of riders face. Anyone can declare that they're a professional. You can just decide to start charging people money and you become a professional. Um, with that in mind, there's no quality control to ensure that professionals in the horse industry are teaching factually correct information, which means many people in the industry, right from the get-go of their riding, they are taught things that they take with them for the rest of their riding career that may or may not be incorrect. I was one of those people with a lot of the stuff that I was initially taught. So because of this, it is imperative that riders practice self-forgiveness. You can do bad things without being a bad person, and you can do bad things without doing so intentionally with malice. We cannot improve the quality of professionals and organizations without addressing the issue causing the misinformation. So part of that is the accountability. Oops. We can cause harm to horses without being intentionally malicious. I would say the vast majority of people in the horse world, even when they're engaging in active abuse, they're not doing it to be intentionally malicious. They're not going about it to intentionally hurt horses. I don't think judges and stewards who witness problematic riding and don't do anything, I don't think they're doing it to be intentionally malicious to the horses. It's not with a purpose to harm horses, but the problem is that when you're surrounded by problematic training methods, it becomes very hard to identify them when you see it everywhere. If every horse you witness is stressed, how are you supposed to use that as a point of comparison to look at what is a stressed horse versus what is a relaxed horse? And I think that's the case for a lot of people in the industry. We grow up being used to witnessing stressed horses, so then we don't know how to tell the difference between stress and relaxation, and then it also comes across as a personal attack when people talk about these problems in the industry because it feels like they're criticizing everything when really the problem is just that broad. We all make mistakes. So these photos here, that's me and my horse. The top photo is when he was very stressed and I thought it was normal for him to be bronking and refusing and just a ball of stress at shows because I was taught to ride through it by my earlier role models. So a lot of people will call people like myself a keyboard warrior or a couch trainer. Um, I want to point out that I'm happy to criticize myself and I stand here today to encourage and advocate for well-intentioned riders who have been led astray by popular industry tactics. I'm here today not because I think I'm better than everyone, not because I have not made mistakes, but because I have made mistakes and I hope to help other people make those mistakes for not as long as I did and to cause less damage to their horses as a result. The entire time I was harming horses, I didn't do it intentionally. I loved them the whole time, but I didn't know better, and I was encouraged by a lot of role models and people in the industry to continue doing things how I was. The reason why I chose that top photo... <laughs> So just, just for reference, the reason why I chose the top photo is not to be like bits are bad, but because you can see tension lines in his neck, his musculature is worse. He has a very prominent chin and tense nose and a stressed eye. That's why I picked that one. That's him walking out of the arena after finishing a jumper course. Your horse will thank you for owning your mistakes. So this again is comparison. The left photos are the befores. I chose the left photo during a flat schooling with him because he's showing an equine pain face and a lot of stress. And then I compared it to a photo of him off property at the beach where it's new to him and he has more reason to be stressed because he's at home in the left photo. The second left photo is also at a show. You'll notice that his nose is in front of the vertical, but he's still stressed. He's gritting his teeth, he's grimacing, and he has a very flared nostril. Once again, the right photo is at the beach when he's off property and would have more reason to be stressed, but he exhibits far less stress. So these again, the, the left photos are both show photos of him exhibiting extensive tension in his face. The reason why I chose the top one here um, is because it kind of just shows how my equipment has changed. I used to ride him in a flash noseband and I used to almost always use a running martingale, which I'm not in that photo. Um, and I used to have to always ride him with a whip, otherwise he wouldn't want to go forward. And things have changed since then. So sometimes we lose patience, sometimes we get frustrated with our horses, and sometimes we make mistakes due to our emotional state. Part of speaking up and engaging in self-improvement is practicing self-accountability so you can own it when you make mistakes and catch yourself sooner when you're engaging in harmful practices to reduce them over time. 
Improving horse welfare after being trained to engage in harmful tactics for years takes practice. You can't just decide one day that you want to do better and do it all the time. You're going to resort to your old practices occasionally, but the key is to try to catch yourself earlier and earlier so that you can eventually make change. And you can start to catch yourself before you have that big emotional response. The photo I chose there, the left photo, is the musculature on one of my off-the-track thoroughbreds, which is absolutely terrible. Um, that's from many years ago. The right is better musculature. I still don't love it because his neck is not great. You can see where he held tension um, in his neck, but it's an improvement. So in order to improve, riders must hold themselves accountable. It doesn't mean you need to be perfect or mistake-free but it means you need to hold yourself accountable for mistakes. When you lose patience, rather than beating yourself up and being like, oh, I'm such a terrible person, or avoiding doing so by being like, what I did is totally fine, look at it and go, I lost my patience there. What led to that? What were the steps that caused me to be so over threshold that I took it out on my horse? And how can I manage that so it doesn't get to that point next time? Owning past mistakes and managing shame is important. You can't really speak out if you're actively ashamed of yourself because it feels like you are criticizing yourself to a degree that is uncomfortable to do so in the public eye. Admitting to past wrongs, though, takes away the power from people who may seek to use your mistakes about you, against you. That is one of the biggest power moves that I've learned over the years, is calling myself out. It takes all the power away from other people who would call me out and use it against me and it completely undoes any argument that they typically use. If I just go, yeah, you're right, I used to do the same thing. I used to be unkind to my horse. I used to engage in abusive tactics. The left photos there are my Arabian horse, my very first horse. Um, you can see an over-tightened noseband in the top photo, and he's exceptionally hyperflexed in the bottom photo, obviously. Um, and we're here for a hyperflexion meeting, so I'm here to say that you can change. I used to do stuff like that, and I saw no problem with riding behind the vertical because my trainers taught me from the age of four that there was no problem with it. I couldn't see the damage I was causing my horse. I couldn't see how stressed he was because I'd been taught to ignore it. Holding yourself accountable and practicing self-accountability also creates incredible teaching moments for other riders and can open the door for people to realize that there's no shame in making mistakes. I find that the horse industry really shames people for making mistakes. They try to make you feel like you need to know everything and that if you don't, you're an inadequate rider. And if that's where you place your value, you're always going to try to justify what you do and what your instructors do in order to avoid the level of judgment that we see in the industry. No one is perfect and many of us have caused harm, but that doesn't mean that we're doomed to forever be harmful riders or that we're bad people. Learning how and when to speak up takes practice. Finding your voice in harmful situations can be very difficult. Following words with actions is most important. Action and how you treat and handle horses is most important. The photo I chose there is me doing cooperative care with a Mustang filly that I adopted. The reason why I chose that one is because that's a big change that I've brought into my personal riding is using positive reinforcement and practicing more science-based methods. And it's something that I would have made fun of years ago and Honestly, like if I met myself six, seven, eight years ago, I would have totally bullied who I am now because it would have made me uncomfortable. Um, but the action and how you handle your horses is what's most important. And speaking up is hard. I've witnessed many really terrible situations of professionals and riders alike abusing their horses. One that I want to share is with my old Arabian gelding when I was like eight years old. He was being too heavy in my hands at a show. My trainer took it upon herself to tie his head to his girth while he was in a Kimberwick, and he was so overflexed that the only way he could seek relief was by basically having his chin to his chest. And she left him like that in the stall until, for an hour until he was like convulsing. His muscles were so overworked. And I didn't say anything because I wasn't comfortable speaking up to someone who is a perceived professional. Um, but... That can result in guilt. Silence in, in times of injustice can make you feel guilty. So it's important to be gentle with yourselves regarding how you react in times of stress because you can have a freeze response when you see something really shocking, especially when speaking out against it means that you have to go up against someone who's in a position, in a position of power. Being paralyzed by anxiety doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that's something that you can practice over time or perhaps it's time to start changing role models. Speaking out against the status quo opens you up to criticism, which can be difficult to manage. So it takes practice to get comfortable with this. So remember, discomfort is not always a bad thing. When someone brings up information that causes a visceral reaction in you and makes you feel uncomfortable, I think that everyone should start exploring that reaction. And I'm sure a lot of what we talked about here will make people feel uncomfortable. 
but the fact that they're uncomfortable doesn't mean that the information is not accurate or that they should not listen to it. And feeling uncomfortable with starting to use your voice doesn't mean that you shouldn't start to try to use it to slowly build your comfort zone. Developing a voice starts with small movements, such as making changes in your own riding and how you speak about and reference horse training. Making your words more gentle, no longer using or supporting training, horse training equipment. So watch how you speak about your horse. What, our words matter. I really try now to not call my horses naughty, bad, or anything. Even if I use those terms and I know what I'm referencing is that it's an unwanted behavior. It's not a behavior I want to see. But if I call them naughty, it's justifying to other people that horses can deliberately do something to try to make your day harder. Developing greater compassion for horses facilitate, facilitates self-compassion. Over my years of studying equine behavior and altering my methods as I've learned, I've noticed a massive improvement in my own mental health. Becoming more patient and less forceful with my horses has made me a happier person and greatly improved my own welfare. It's also pushed me to remove industry pressures from the equation in training and realize that a lot of my goals in riding used to be influenced by other people's expectations and the expectations of the industry. I felt the need to compete in order to be valued as an equestrian, even when it damaged my horse's welfare. I felt the need to keep my horses in work all the time to continue training, even when it was damaging to their horse's welfare. And something I've noticed now in the time that I've given my horse almost two years off for hoof rehab is a lot of people have used that against me to suggest that I'm less good of a trainer because I'm not actively riding and producing my horse. And while that would have used to bother me in the past, now I look at it as a clear neon sign of how much improvement we need to have. Because if you're being shamed for giving your horse the time that you need, we're not perpetuating values that actually represent our love for the horse. I've now learned that my value as an equestrian is in how I treat my horses. I don't ever need to swing a leg over a horse again in order to be valued as a horse person because my horses are happy and they're receiving species appropriate care. And when they are in pain, I'm way more likely to notice it now. Those who possess a different value system than I are no longer people whose opinion I respect. We're not on the same moral playground, so when people criticize me using that, it has no impact on me because they're not who I'm looking to for guidance and compliments. Changing personal practices inspires change in others. Be the change that you want to see. I would have mocked the practices that I now promote if you asked me about it years ago. My discomfort came from the lack of security in myself. I was incredibly insecure and I fought to defend what I knew because the thought of leaving that all behind and walking a new path was so uncomfortable. Moving away from forceful training was very hard at first. Admitting to how prevalent equine stress was and learning how to notice it in the horse world as I learning how to notice it turned the horse world as I knew it completely upside down. Now I can't go to any show without seeing incredibly stressed horses, and it has definitely changed the level of enjoyment that I can have at shows. However, it means that we can improve the industry and not see that so often. So I am happy for the fact that I can now notice it. It also created such a rewarding relationship with my horses and allowed, with, allowed for me to connect with them in ways that I've always dreamed of. There is no way that I would have ever been able to ride around on the beach bridalists like this without altering my practices and also do things like, I think the next slide shows, no, it doesn't, it'll be a slide after this, but do things like um, turning my horse loose on the beach and doing liberty work because I would have had to worry about them leaving me. My horses are quieter, they're calmer, they're easier to handle, they're way more engaged in work, and I don't experience the same level of danger that I had normalized for years. I'm way safer as a rider. There is power in numbers. The more riders who start speaking up, the more potential for change. We all have to start speaking up and pointing out when we see things that aren't acceptable riding practices. And we also have to remember that the act of speaking out on those things doesn't mean that you're assessing complete blame to someone and being like, you are a bad person. It means that in that moment, they committed a wrong, but they can change every moment after that with their actions. So being called out in the moment for doing a wrong doesn't mean you're a terrible person, but if you commit to engaging in those practices again and again, in the moment, you're choosing to engage in practices that are harmful, and that does say something about your character if you continue to replicate those moments, even as you know better. Currently, many riders may try to push riders that discuss welfare into silence using peer pressure and personal attacks. The larger the crowd of people who are willing to speak out, the more difficult it becomes for people to use shame-based tactics to silence discussion. Speaking out may also help educate receptive people and change their perspective, even if it doesn't happen immediately. Think about planting a seed in someone's brain. I have noticed the power of this online a lot because there's people who I remember their, their handles because they come on my pages to insult me and degrade me for years. 
Uh, and some of those people have later come forward to me and said that I've changed their perspective. So if you can change someone who is that vitriolic by continuing to plant seeds of learning in their brain, you can change anyone. The only way, though, that massive organizations and corporations that are making multi-millions or billions of dollars off of horse competition will change and make sweeping welfare changes is with public pressure, because it's expensive to do so. It's expensive for them to change the status quo. So your voice has more power than you think. The more potential we have for change, it'll also create a safe space for others to speak up the more of us that there are. And being outspoken about wrongs does not allow for harmful practices to continue being normalized. If you watch things happen and you don't speak out on your platforms, even if you don't do it in the moment, if we're all apathetic and we don't say anything, the practices will continue because it makes it comfortable for those people to continue engaging them in them because they're not being held accountable. And multi-billion dollar organizations are not going to have incentive to change without public pressure because ultimately they are in this for money. It's not truly about the love of the horse. It is a money-making venture. It is a business. Together, we can create a world of more empathetic riding. Everyone wins with kinder methods, especially the horse. Reforming the industry will completely change horse rider relationships as we know them for the better. And the photo I used there is me with my little four-year-old at the beach. I turned him loose and we're doing target training. And that was a moment of pride for me because I thought about Milo at four years old and if I had done the same thing with him, it would not have gone like that. He probably would have been in the US by now. Um, so change can really alter how you show up for your horses. And it's totally worth it in the end, even if the journey to get there is initially difficult. So thank you. Together, let's change the horse world. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shelby. That was 20 minutes flat.